What up guys, my name is Chris, this is Wheelhouse Trading, and welcome to the Wheelhouse. This is gonna be a good video. We're gonna go over what I see in stocks on these indexes, what I think is gonna happen. We're gonna look at some crypto news to keep you up to date. We're gonna talk about crypto and what might happen, what could happen, and what I see in the charts. And we're also going to take a look at the difference of a bottoming process or an emerging leader moving out of phase four to phase one. In addition, I'm going to give you some strategies to hold on to your gains and teach you how to understand if we are just looking at simply market breadth and a retest on the descending primary downtrend on the Dow, or if we are experiencing a bearish pivot. So right here on the Dow, I have been explaining that we are in a primary downtrend, okay? It's very important. And when I first started the channel, even though there was a lot of people out there, Ray Dalio, Jeremy Grantham, Robert Kiyosaki, all kinds of people that I respect, read their books, love listening to them, brilliant people, they were calling for a bear market and a collapse of everything bubble, a lost decade, and yeah, absolutely but they didn't know when i called it right before it dropped and said get out right before within a week and said get out and i did i took all my money and gains from the bull market and then i started triple leveraging short these pivots to the downside making a ton of money and i walked you through when we hit a pivot when to run it up when to run it down when to run it up when to run it down when to run it up when to run it down the whole way i explained the double bottom and said this is where we buy i explained how smart money is trained how smart money thinks and why now as it went up it came down and it was pretty scary there was news catalyst i said hold the line and we did and we made a ton of money it did come up to the descending primary downtrend. There was an institutional large sale. What that pink diamond is in our coding is it's an accumulation of many large institutions and funds, accumulative selling, and it'll pop a diamond on there. It showed it came down. It happened to be right where the FOMC data came out, but we had the Jedi green lights. This was still blue. Our cloud was blue. We had price action above the 200 and we bounced right off support and broke out of the primary downtrend and kept going. And I have indicated that we went through one, two, three, four minor trend reversals and out of the primary downtrend. And our first major trend reversal is right here because this was a big momentum rally and also right on the circle of the fib right at the peak of the pivot okay and it indicates with this yellow line that if we were to get over it it would be a major trend reversal usually they'll knock on the door a couple times before breaking out but i had said in my group yesterday we need to tighten our stops to the five ema on profitable trades okay when i woke up this morning i had about 200 grand moved to the side all in profit. NVIDIA, AMD, Square, DocuSign, whole bunch of ones that I love. Not worried about it because I have A, the option to rebuy. B, I have the principal and the profit. And C, I can double down into momentum on other stocks that are in the red by one, two, three, four percent and momentum spring out. What I think is going on in the stock market is that a lot of the major negative catalysts that we experienced during the bear market are moving down the line to the past. The supply chains are easing, okay? There are layoffs against sales margins, therefore the earnings are still holding up. So I do think that we are going to continue to head up on the Dow, and the Dow is a leading indicator. The SPY, the Russell, and the NASDAQ will follow the Dow, but probably the SPY will be second to get out of its downtrend. <clears throat> there needs to be a pullback. There needs to be market breath. This is very normal. And even though we have the Jedi green lights, and we have price action above the 200, and we have gotten out of the primary downtrend, 
we are having what looks like an early pivot to the downside. This is probably normal. It might just test and bounce off of the descending primary downtrend, or it could get worse if there is a major catalyst. And I do think the stock market <clears throat> is okay and it's going to be heading up. There will be volatility. There will be ups and downs. There always is if you've been in the market. This is a bull run and you can tell there's downs, there's ups, there's downs. There's, I mean, there's down days while it's rolling up, all kinds of them. This is natural, this is normal, expect it, it's not a big deal. This has been a great rally. Having a little retrace, possibly a bounce off of this, doesn't mean uh, that you need to sell your positions. However, if you are profitable, tightening up your stops is never a bad idea. And if you do get moved over to cash with your profit, so what? You have your profit, you can buy more and you can swing it again. What if this thing comes down and bounces here and you buy it again and you make money on it all the way back to here where it rejects? You just do it over and over. Now, I'm getting a little bit of conflicting information and it is a little early to say, but I wanna give you a little bit of reasoning of what I'm thinking, okay? Over here on the right, I have my watch list called Leverage Bears. These are double and triple leverage. Now, when all of these are green, in after hours, pre-market, or during the day, that is a leading indicator for me and shows sentiment that the market thinks that it is going to retrace. Doesn't have to be a, a crash or something huge, but it's going to retrace maybe a day, two, three days, something like that. Not that big of a deal. But when you see this many, all of them, 100% of the leverage bear list, uh, that shows that you know we're ready for a little retrace. The second thing that makes me believe that we might see a small bearish pivot or possibly a full bearish pivot is simply because we are high in the channel. And when we get high in the channel, like right here, if you look up the screen, what happened? We came down, okay? When you get high in the channel, like here, what happens? We came down. When you get high in the channel and you look up the screen, what happens? We come down. So it's possible that we do come down. However, because a lot of the things are in the past, it leads me to believe that we're not gonna come down as far as we did the last times that these were at peaks or at these levels, okay? We're starting to stabilize, things are looking better. And like I said, the SPY will follow. Just to pull up the SPY for a second, you can see we are still in a primary downtrend, okay? We had this reverse head and shoulders. It did go up, a lot of uncertainty, somewhat of a coiling pattern between all these different ranges. Finally found its direction. There was a big institutional sell. It did get the Jedi green lights though, which says you can hold, and this is blue saying you can hold, and it was correct. It went up, retested with a higher low on this W formation. The cloud stayed blue and yesterday I indicated we're right at the 200 and now we're pivoting down. Maybe we pivot here and go up. Maybe we break down and pivot here. We don't know, we'll take it day by day. But capital protection and trade management is where your mind should be at this point, okay? Now I wanna show you something. I wanna teach you something. And I want you to watch all the way to the end of this video because what I show you and what I teach you is really important. And I'm only on YouTube to help you. For those of you that have been on the channel know that I'm retired, I don't need to do this. I originally got on YouTube because there was a lot of bad information back in 2020. And I wanted to teach people the correct way so that they could not only make money and identify the pivot, have the right entry, the successful exit, but hold on to their gains. And I wanna show you the difference between a position that has bottomed and has left phase four, entered phase one and is emerging as a leader versus something that is still in phase four in a bottoming process. And then I'm gonna show you on Bitcoin how we had a bottoming process, now a new leg lower, a new box of confluence, a tight range. And for the time being, that's the range that we're playing in we will not know where crypto is going until more news comes out on the contagion effects. And if those companies that are having issues 
have to sell assets with less conviction to avoid a liquidity crisis and or margin call, what that might look like. And until we have all the information, nobody, not me, not you, can really say what's going on. But what we can do is be logical, rational, sensible, non-emotional, and look at the technicals to see where we could go level by level, up or down, and take it day by day, play by play. Now, this is Home Depot on the daily, okay? You can see the bull run, you can see the distribution, you can see the bear run, okay? You see these blue lines, these are our supports making lower lows, okay? Finally, it comes down to here and it makes a low, okay? The green lights goes off and it goes blue and the sync system goes off and it heads up and you make a lot of money there's an institutional seller it comes down but you stay in and it breaks above the 200. remember one of the rules to get out of phase four into phase one is the price action needs to be above the 200. unfortunately it was rejected it failed and it retested as a double bottom it fought back up you get more sellers it comes up, you get more sellers. That's obviously profit taking on this one because as they sold here, people were like, oh shoot. And when there was a big green day, they sold on it to take profit. Triple bottom, one, two, three. Jedi green lights goes off. This is blue, it says get in, comes to the 200, starts to reject. Institutional whales start to sell. But Home Depot is a fighter. People remember it has good earnings. People know there was a hurricane that's going to show up on their next earnings with all the materials and supplies that needed to be bought. So Home Depot now has found a bottom, retested it, established it, and now has price action above the 200. That is what a bottoming process moving out of phase four into phase one looks like. Now, if we head over to Bitcoin, we can see the same thing. We can see that we had a bull run, okay? We had distribution, we had a bear run, phase four, okay? We established a floor at around this 17.6 area, okay? It starts to move up, and then it basically finds this new area around 19,000, which is a higher low. For about a month and a half, maybe longer, it grinds right on here. And at that time, I was explaining in the map book and the background information that I have that I could see institutional large whale accumulation as a buy zone. In fact, let me show you something. Okay, so these red areas that you see are institutional seller blocks bearish blocks you can see when it went red here it dumped you can see when it went red here it dumped you can see when it went red here it dumped you can see when it went red here it dumped and this was it showing a thin blue line but after the sam bankman freed this is a new one and you could see that it dumped Okay, now that you know that, we had a bottom and then a higher low and an accumulation zone and we were building momentum, the Sam Bankman Free dropped us down and in between these two lines right here is now a new range, okay? The range is about 16,200 to 16,700. Let's back it up on the hour and let's see what it looks like. So right here you see the capitulation and you see it fall below. It fought above the lower range, got rejected on the higher, but retested the lower range of that 16,200. It went for a rally. There was institutional selling, tried to rally higher, more institutional selling, and it retested the higher range. Fought harder, but more people got out as the FUD came out came down, fought back up, more selling, pushed it down, Bitcoin's a fighter, comes back up, and it's been fighting on the line until you get more institutional selling, which drops it back down. Okay, now, it fights back up into the range, it comes up, but it gets rejected and retests the bottom range. It fights out for a breakout, 
and then fails and then tries to retest and fails. Okay, this zone right here from 16.2 to 16.7 is a new range that is a sticky box of confluence. Okay, now let's look at it on the five minute. Okay, so this shaded green area is the new range, okay? Now, it can go lower and create a new low, or it could break out, but this is definitely a new sticky zone that we have to pay attention to. So on the five minute, you see it comes down, everything I said uh, comes up, comes down, fights, and uh, tries to break out, tries to break out again, and fights, and it's just, it's just stuck in this zone, okay? Now, until we get more information on the contagion effects, okay, I'll give you an example. Let's say there's 50 companies that had a lot of money in FTX or they have a lot of money in crypto and now they have investments under contract for say building a nuclear energy plant somewhere or some sort of big real estate uh, deal that they can't get out of. So through process of elimination, if they're going to have a liquidity crisis and they're going to be margin called, they can't use those. So they're going to establish what it is they can sell and what it is that they can't sell. So number one, we need to figure out all the people affected. Number two, we need to understand those people that are affected, what type of liquidity crisis they may or may not be having. And number three, what is their conviction in the cryptocurrencies that they hold, if any, and if they do decide to sell at what level, and that is going to indicate a major drop on that particular token, but may react over the whole crypto industry. So with crypto, we cannot know. We have a lot of questions and we don't have a lot of answers. We're gonna take a look at the news, we're gonna see what's going on, but nobody really will know what's gonna happen on Bitcoin or crypto until we get more answers on this FTX, BlockFi, and these contagion effects spreading throughout all financial markets globally. Speaking of contagion, Here's another one. Genesis Global halts withdrawals citing unprecedented market turmoil. The troubled firm is also acting as the liquidity provider of Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust. According to a new tweet by Genesis Global on November 16th, the institutional crypto lender said it would temporarily suspend redemptions and new loan originations in the lending business. In explanation, the decision the firm cited unprecedented market turmoil related to the collapse of troubled cryptocurrency exchange FTX, resulting in abnormal levels of withdrawals that Genesis Global claims to have exceeded its current liquidity. Now, I will remind you that it is okay to pull your money out of exchanges and onto your own wallet, which I did immediately when Coindesk released the balance sheet and then CZ made that first tweet. I did that myself immediately only because even if there was a 1% truth to the matter with FTX, it wasn't worth the risk of having large amounts of money on an exchange. I'm glad I did that. Now everybody is talking about that, which is great. And you guys should all be in control and having your own custody of your own crypto okay okay more on the story gemini recovers from services outage following genesis withdrawal freeze gemini the crypto exchange founded by the winkleboss twins in 2014 experienced sweeping service disruption shortly after genesis froze customer withdrawals on wednesday the firm later clarified that an Amazon Web Services outage was responsible for the disruptions and restored functionality shortly afterwards. I'm not big on coincidence, okay? Is it strange that every single time something like Crypto.com sends $400 million to Gate.io that then releases their balance sheet showing that it's a one-for-one one and then it's an accident? 
or Gemini here says it was an outage that was responsible by Amazon Web Services. There seems to always be an excuse immediately after something is uncovered pertaining to the contagion effects of this FTX saga. And of course, FTX investors sue Bankman Freed over yield bearing crypto asset accounts. FTX investors have sued the company's ex CEO, Sam Bankman Freed, for illegally offering yield bearing crypto accounts at the now insolvent exchange. The lawsuit, filed in Miami Tuesday, alleges that FTX crypto yield bearing accounts were unregistered securities illegally sold in the U.S., according to Reuters. Now that the exchange has failed to honor withdrawals, investors claim to have sustained $11 billion in damages. The lawsuit also seeks damages from numerous celebrities who were involved with promoting FTX, such as tenor star Naomi Osaka and NFL quarterback Tom Brady. Many high-profile athletes and teams have been rushing to cut ties with the firm over the past week, including the Golden State Warriors. If you watch my last four or five videos, you can see a lot more about the shell game, about the money movement, about the hack, about the lawsuits, about the exposure on this entire situation. <laughs> and right here, SBF is the wolf of Wall Street in crypto, says Michael Saylor. The executive chairman of MicroStrategy and prominent Bitcoin bull Michael Saylor linked the CEO of FTX, Sam Bankman Free, to the notorious Jordan Belfort, also known as the Wolf of Wall Street. I know Jordan Belfort. I partied with him before. In Michael Saylor's view, Sam Bankman Freed was using stolen money and cooperated with corrupt regulators to keep his business going. Make a movie about it. Absolutely make a movie about it. I'll watch it. <laughs> Crypto.com sends a letter to its clients assuring their funds are safe. Crow recovers 30% since yearly low. And we spoke about this yesterday pertaining to the hack. FTX exploiter address is now the 35th largest Ethereum holder. If you want to learn more about the inside information and root access and alternating pass key situation and who could have had that and how this was moved to an old Alameda wallet and moved to Tether, who can halt just one address from Tether to the DAI network who cannot halt just one address, but has to halt a whole network and then moved over to Australia where corporate entity laws are different. That's a video you should take a look at. It's got a lot of good information. You should check it out. So right here, it says the crypto industry just experienced the most shocking insolvency of a custodian since Mt. Gox with the stunning collapse of FTX. The exchange was also hit by a $600 million exploit over the weekend. The mysterious hacker behind it is now the 35th richest Ethereum holder. Several addresses tied to the FTX account drainer moved more than 21,555 Ethereum worth over 27 million to a single address, which was then converted to the DAI network on the swapping service CalSwap. PeckShield revealed that the addresses raked in over 48 million of DAI and swapped the funds into 37,000 ETH. Data also suggests that the account drainer currently holds over 288,000 Ethereum, thereby making it the 35th largest holder of the crypto asset. So Sam Bankman Freed, FTX's ex-CEO, claims Alameda had more assets than liabilities just a few days before bankruptcy filing. I'm going to call bullshit because if you go back to my video a couple days ago, I showed you very clearly in the on-chain data, the beginning of the internal collapse at FTX started when the Terra Luna situation happened. And because Alameda was leverage trading and lost a lot of money, Sam Bankman Freed and his executive group built a backdoor to not raise alarms or alert the internal employees of large money movements to Alameda who then leverage traded or gambled more user funds and it just got worse. I want to take a second to explain something to you. Many YouTubers and many of these big exchanges have been promoting and pitching 
that they're going to stake all their money in cake or they're going to stake their money on Coinbase for this or with Crypto.com for that. Never once did I make a video about staking my coins. I understand interest. I have degrees in finance, economics, and business, and I've been doing this for a very long time. And anybody with common sense, even if you don't have a degree in finance, knows that if you're in a bear market and the value of the asset is decreasing, yet you're yielding on a staking platform a high yield, eventually that's going to catch up to the exchange and collapse. It's just bad business. It's not prudent behavior nor ethical. So here we go with more bullshit claiming that Alameda had more assets than liabilities just a few days before bankruptcy filing. How is that even possible to be in front of us right now? That makes no sense. And how do these exchanges expect to have high yield staking in a bear market with a devalued asset and claim or think or consider they're going to be able to stay in business if there's a bank run? Just like I moved all of my tokens off exchange within the first hour of this hitting the news a week ago, they should know that if there's a bank run, especially in an industry or space like crypto, with the nature of volatility that it has and the sentiment driven movements that can happen like a bank run from a tweet or selling of 500 million FTT tokens by CZ at Binance, this certainly can affect each of these centralized exchanges and the people at the top are making poor decisions and they're using your money to line their pocket, to beef their balance sheet, to do capital raises, and they're all getting caught, and we, the people, are feeling the pain. And like I showed in that video a few videos back on my channel, here's an article saying, on-chain data showed FTX was in trouble right before it collapsed. The collapse of FTX put the market once again into a state of extreme fear with Bitcoin falling down to its lowest level of the year at 16,000. In the ensuing week, 140 million FTT flowed to Binance and the token fell from $26 to below $2. This triggered a run on FTX, a supposed hack draining 473 million from the reserves and the declaration of a bankruptcy by the world's second largest trading platform. A summary of events. November 2nd, Coindesk releases Alameda's private financial documents. November 6th, Binance founder CZ posts that Binance will sell off all FTT coins on its books in the coming months. Alameda CEO Caroline Ellison offers to buy all of Binance's FTT holdings at 22. November 6th, FTT experiences its first sharp drop, 10% down and goes back to 24 after Ellison's offer. November 8th, FTX International suspends withdrawals. November 8th, FTT plummets to $5. November 8th, Binance announces it might be interested in acquiring FTX. November 11th, acquisition terminated. November 11th, FTX files for bankruptcy and user funds disappear. So as I've mentioned in my last couple videos, that Ethereum was in an 11 or 12 month descending primary downtrend and it had broken out of the primary downtrend, which is considerably a bullish move. After the Sam Bankman Freed situation happened, it fell back in to the descending, but it fought out to key levels. And I've been saying in the last two videos and this one, that we need to stay on the top side of that descending so that we do not go back in to a confirmed downtrend. Now this article says, Ethereum price weakens near key support, but traders are afraid to open short positions. Ethereum price hovers at a key support level, and while it's softening, data shows pro traders are reluctant to go short. Yeah. So Ethereum has been stuck in a range between 1170 and 1350 since November 10th through November 15th. During this time, investors are continuing to digest the negative impact of the November 11th Chapter 11 Bankruptcy Filing of FTX Exchange. FTX bankruptcy freezes millions worth of crypto company funds. 
The collapse of cryptocurrency exchange FTX continues to have knock-on effects throughout the crypto industry, with multiple crypto-focused companies reporting significant amounts of their capital stuck on FTX. Once we know how many funds, institutions, venture capitalist firms have contagion, have to liquidate to avoid margin calls, or even worse, go out of business and declare bankruptcy, we will not know where the bottom is. I will be able to show you levels up and down that will be key to the movements of any crypto or any stock, but pertaining to Ethereum and Bitcoin specifically. And I find this very interesting. Bohemian liquidators say FTX wasn't authorized to file for bankruptcy in the US. Despite the company's convoluted corporate structure, Bahamas-based lawyers say everything falls under the FTX digital markets umbrella, a bohemian entity subject to bohemian law. The bankruptcy proceedings of collapsed crypto exchange FTX are already shaping up to be chaotic. The collective hundred odd companies that filed for bankruptcy last Friday have an estimated 1 million creditors, but bohemian liquidators threw another wrench into the process on Tuesday. Bahamas-based lawyer Brian Sims of the provisional liquidators appointed by the Bahamas Supreme Court said in a court filing that FTX was not authorized to file for bankruptcy in the U.S., adding that he rejects the validity of any purported attempt to place FTX affiliates in bankruptcy. Sims' declaration came after he and other liquidators filed for Chapter 15 bankruptcy protection on behalf of of the Bahamas arm of the insolvent crypto exchange, FTX Digital Markets. Sims did not ask the U.S. courts to dismiss the bankruptcy proceedings, but he did request that the court recognize the validity of the bohemian legal actions, which he said could impact U.S. proceedings for the other FTX-controlled entities. Despite the seemingly complex structure of the FTX brand companies, the entire FTX brand was ultimately operated from a single location, the Bahamas. So Sims has asked the court for provisional relief, including the recognition of bohemian bankruptcy and liquidation proceedings and orders entrusting FTX assets located in the US to bohemian liquidators, authorizing urgent discovery measures and preventing any of FTX assets to be transferred, encumbered, or otherwise disposed of. So what I want you to recognize is this right here. FTX assets located in the US to bohemian liquidators authorizing urgent discovery measures. Holy shit. Urgent discovery measures. We're about to find out some real dirty, dark, filthy, scumbag type of shit. And we will get there, but as of for now, we're going to stay in the range. The dust is settling. We'll be able to see that in the charts here in a minute when I show you. But let's take a look at today's cryptocurrency prices and market cap. So the global crypto market cap is at $829.24 billion. It's down 2.43% over the last 24 hours. It was at $840 billion. It got as low as $794 billion. It is what it is. If we look at the cryptos, we're basically the same place, essentially within a couple hundred dollars that we have been in the last couple videos. We're at 16,558 right now. Yesterday we were at 16,700. Ethereum was at 1255. Today we're at 1209. Everything is waiting for the dust to settle. And if we go take a look at the crypto bubbles, we can see that you have a lot of uncertainty. You have a lot of concern. People need answers and we have a lot of questions. The main thing that we need to know right now is how many people were affected on a large scale. Because it's easy to find out how many were affected on a small scale like retail investors. But if we understand the contagion and if there's going to be margin calls or a collapse to major financial firms, we can then follow their liquidation process to try to prevent a liquidity crisis. And we can follow 
what they're going to sell off to either exit a position or just be knowledgeable about the direction of the move that's coming. Okay, so what you're looking at here is the daily chart of Solana. Solana had a high of 260 bucks relatively. It's been in a savage bear market making lower highs, okay? It started making a bottoming process and then once the Sam Bankman Freed exposure came out, it dropped. Now it's made a new potential bottom. When I was saying we need to wait for the dust to settle, this is a visual representation of what that will look like. You see that it broke after a bottoming process. And then when you back it up to the one hour, you can see how it dropped through a capitulation, established a bottom, retested it, and now it's just kind of going sideways. Right there, that's what I mean by the dust is settling. The way that markets work is there's a buyer and a seller and there's something to buy and sell or exchange for a value and the market will decide on what the value is. The drop and capitulation is from the news. It'll go through its process and finally find some form of a dust settling bottom or new range low. So currently Solana has now calmed down and now if we're going to buy or average down, we're gonna wait for some strength, at least on the hourly, possibly to get over the 200. You may pay a little more than it is now, but you'll be doing it into momentum and everybody's pretty much down on it unless you didn't own it and just bought it at 12 bucks. And just remember, every single chart for the history of all markets, stocks and crypto now if it's a brand new crypto token it hasn't gone through all four phases but they all will and they all will have this on the chart that i'm going to show you right now when there's distribution and then there's a bear market which is called phase four it will find a bottom or go through a bottoming process it will do what it does and it will eventually get above the 200 this purple line the price action will get above and when the blue ribbon gets above that you are in phase one which is the beginning of the accumulation phase this is where smart money is taught to buy retail doesn't really buy here they buy in the participation phase which is usually over in here and then that's phase two and then there's the distribution phase and again phase four and it just repeats it finds a bottom and then it gets price action above the 200 and it emerges as leaders. And as a breakout trader and knowing all these different systems and strategies that I teach and that I do, and I learned from three of the best in the entire world, one made the best system ever created, beat the S&P by over 2,700% 10 years in a row and was tested against 50 other strategies. I teach that one. The other person is two-time world champion trader. The third one is the most profitable trader the world has ever seen. From 11,000 to 42 million in one year audited. That's who I learned how to break out trade from. That's how I learned about cup and handles. That's how I learned about first, second, third stage basis. That's how I learn about all the things that I teach you. And I teach you from all those principles and strategies, as well as Richard Wyckoff and Charles Dow. And then we built an algorithm to modernize everything with predictive information that has all types of feeds and calculations for pattern recognition, um, Elliott Wave, what's going on in exchanges, you know, it, it plugs in, you know, if institutions are buying or selling, has the map book. In fact, we have over 100 indicators built in to our algorithm. Things like MACDs, RSIs, Money Flow Index, Parabolic SARs, Alligators, Bollinger Bands, Linear Regressions, 
all types of things that you don't have to worry about because we're putting a simple green triangle that says buy when it meets all these background conditions and then the probability is super high so when you have an emerging leader like netflix that's gone through its four phases and the price action gets above the 200 you have the jedi green lights and the ribbon is right behind it just like home depot and now netflix you're starting to see emerging leaders now what i have on the screen is something different this is called a bottoming process a bottoming process takes about six months once it establishes a floor it takes relatively six months can be a little shorter can be a little longer but historically statistically that's what it is about six months and if i just draw a line from its established low here on chain link you can clearly see that it is just in a bottoming process here it is test test and now it's testing and then if it bounces and it gets above it moves to phase one now the first ones in the stock market and the first ones in the crypto market are leaders and leaders tend to go not only first but further meaning if you look at something like Chili's Chili's got above the 200 made a high came back to retest the 200 twice made a higher high and then it came down with some of this inflation news and FUD and it broke below the 200 but fought right back up, got the Jedi green lights and actually made a higher high. But the news hit Wall Street, insiders and all over about FTX and Sam Bakeman Freed and Elevator Research and there's your institutional sale or whale style sell. Boom, it collapses. But a true leader will bounce back, and it did, right above the 200. Two candles came down, but did, the wick came below, but the body didn't. Next day, came down below, but the body didn't. Next day, bounced, okay? And then, two more follow-through days. That's what a leader looks like. That's what a bottoming process looks like. That's what a leader leaving phase four, moving to phase one looks like. And of course, we have Bitcoin stuck in a range due to uncertainty, too many questions, not enough answers pertaining to the contagion and the effects it'll have on the crypto industry. My name is Chris. This is Wheelhouse Trading and welcome to the Wheelhouse.